Hi, everyone. And welcome to our second ornament chat of the Ornaments Refractive Cosmologies Colloquium. A series of conversations that explores the role of ornament in the contemporary architecture and probes ornaments' enduring power to evoke the cosmos. After a long break, after our first ornament and ecology um, chat, we finally caved in and opted for the Zoom thing everyone's been doing nowadays. So really, it's so wonderful to have so many of you here from all over the place. This is really exciting. As a reminder, this lecture is being followed by Ornament and Neuroscience on April 14th and Making Ornament on April 26th. And this, this, this chat will also be recorded for Serity. We hope you will join us for the following events. And let's get started. So to introduce ourselves really quickly, I'm Misha. I graduated from uh, the School of Architecture and the School of the Environment in 2019. Um, having spent um, much of my time at Yale studying with Kent, um, then going on to TA his course, um, and then in my work at Centerbrook Architects over the two years since I graduated, I've been lucky to be able to implement some of the things I've learned from Kent, and even if it's not quite ornament, ornamental details on several projects. Um, so that's been very, very uh, rewarding. My interest in ornament arises really from my interest in biophilia and in design's ability to promote the human nature connection. I think ornament is really key to that. And Kest and I did an independent study with Kent a few years ago um, along the School of the Environment, exploring the links between ornament and ecology. Um, and that's the subject of our first um, ornament chat in this series, which occurred before the pandemic last February. Um, and for those of you who have asked for a recording of that, um, while we don't have a video, we will be releasing um, documentation of it um, at the end of this cycle. So um, we're excited to share some of that. So my name is Cassandra. I also go by Cass. Um, I was also class of 2019 at Yale, and I had the pleasure of taking Kent's ornament design and theory class. I also had the amazing experience of being able to work for, for his uh, Kent Lumer studio. And that was a big lesson in understanding how ornament is made, because drawing a beautiful scroll is not the same thing as building one. <laughs> um, and I also had the chance to, um, as Misha said, work on an independent study um, on ornament and ecology, as well as um, some independent research for Kent. Um, and this particular research that he and I were working on was sort of feeding into what, what Kent is presenting today in part. Um, and uh, we were looking at how ornament is sort of the essence of ornament in terms of uh, the structure and geom geometry versus natural elements and kind of trying to understand how many, how many examples of ornament uh, contain natural uh, imagery, such as uh, foliation um, or biological elements. So if, if you're interested in, in hearing more about that, Kent and I would be happy to um, explain more. Um, yeah, but after our discussion. Yeah, so a quick note for participants, please keep yourselves muted while um, Kent is presenting. We do hope that we can have a lively discussion after Kent's presentation, but with 72 participants and counting, which is really exciting, um, obviously we can't all talk at once. So um, we'd ask you after Kent's finished speaking, if you could write your questions and comments for Kent in the chat box and we will call on you to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question on video, um, but um, we'll try and curate that so it isn't um, isn't a free for all. Um, so yeah, do please keep yourself muted um, otherwise. Um, and um, I think that's it. If you'd like to receive um, additional updates on future lectures, um, please use the contact us button on the Yale Ornament um, website, which you can reach by Googling Yale Ornament, um, yaleornament.wordpress.com. We're also on Facebook um, and the School of Architecture website. So without further ado, um, let's talk about Kent. All right. So I thought we would start with a little anecdote. Um, on the first day of the ornament design and theory class that Misha and I took, we recall a really great story that Kent told us 
Uh, when Kent was a young lad in architecture school, he was sitting um, at a lecture and his professor was showing some glass slides of the Carson Peary Scott department building by Louis Sullivan. This building was a multi-story marble, sorry, marble <laughs> at the time of its construction. But, but the slides being shown cut off the building's bottom. Why, you ask? According to the professor, the bottom wasn't important enough to see. Kent would not take this for an answer. And he, he went in, in search of that answer. The reason the bottom wasn't important, quote unquote, was because it was gloriously ornamented. And so the long journey of rediscovering, uncovering, and creating ornaments began. So Kent studied physics and architecture at MIT before then pursuing an MFA in sculpture at Yale. While at Yale, Kent worked with influential artists and thinkers like Joseph Albers. He's taught at Yale for about 50 years. Uh, he began teaching ornament theory and design at the School of Architecture in the 70s and has also maintained a professional practice in ornament since 1961, um, founding Kent Bloomer Studio in 1985. He's the author of Body, Memory, and Architecture, co-author of Mimetic Rivalry, and the author of The Nature of Ornament. Kent has fought for the importance of ornament in the darkest of times, when modernism and its ghosts railed against it. But perhaps what makes Kent's contributions so impossible to ignore is his incredible ability to synthesize from diverse disciplines like physics, ecology, music, and gestalt theory, allowing him to define the cosmos within which ornament reigns. And an intro to Kent would not be complete without mentioning Nona, his faithful sidekick and technological wizard who's sitting right there. <laughs> so without further ado, we're gonna pass the technological baton to Kent and Nona, and please join us in welcoming them virtually uh, for this chat. Should we... Yeah, go for it, Kent. You're um, do I share screen now? Yes. Uh, okay. do, do, do you want me to get started? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm sorry. Should I share uh, the screen now? Or the, the, um, yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm, you know, my talk should only be about 25 minutes. And let me explain that. It'll, it could be, you know, 10 times that amount. What? Do you want me to put the first slide on? No. Okay. Uh, I said I, I would point okay. that out. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I haven't done very much of this Zoom lecturing, and it's not exactly something I'm, I'm probably very good at. But um, one way for me to handle that is, is as I is to say what I'm going to do, which is to um, read some statements and I'll lightly comment and, and illustrate them in the hopes that, that these statements will add up to something coherent that we can talk about because I really want to get the answers back from the people that are on the screen and, and are watching this thing. This is supposed to be a conference. Um, so I, I'm just going to jump in with what I said. Um, While majoring uh, in my, my, my own background, while majoring in physics, architecture, and sculpture, in retrospect, I, I, I was surprised what I, I picked up. I studied with Georgie Kepish from the Chicago Bauhaus at MIT, Joseph Albers from the Weimar Bauhaus at Yale, William Huff and Thomas Maldonado from the new Bauhaus from Ohm at Carnegie Technology. I might as well have majored in the Bauhaus. Um, the trajectory of the Bauhaus uh, was spawned by the Berlin School of Experimental Psychology and the thinking of Max Wertheimer, who founded, who was the founder of Gestalt Psychology. His five phenomenon the motion perceived from serial blinking lights is a seminal example of a gestalt, which is regarded as a universal phenomenon. So is the figure ground phenomenon. Now, the, 
I'll just explain those two classical early experiments in the in the Weimar Bauhaus, or even before at Berlin. Um, his uh, the Phi phenomenon um, is simply a matter. Of, I'll describe it. If you have a bunch of lights and there is, you're in a dark room and there are all these light bulbs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You turn on the first one, you turn it on off, and then you turn on the second one, you turn that off, and you turn on the third, and you turn that off, and you turn the fourth. So basically you're you're running the ignited lights down the wall. If you speed that up in a dark room, you eventually get a moving straight line. And what is interesting about them, this to them, that that wasn't the case. There was nothing moving. So the phenomenon of moving was a gestalt, was a closure of those lights in the in the optical and brain. Um, as far as the uh, uh, figure of ground, I assume that most of you know as much as I do about that. But let me just point to a couple of things about it. If we get the Japanese flag with a circle inside of the rectangle, you can look at that two ways and your mind can make up how you what you want to see if they're correctly cal calibrated. You can look at it as a circle with a rectangle behind it that actually the space of which moves behind the circle. Or you can look at it as a hole in a rectangle that you could put your hand through and the space moves behind the rectangle. So in both of those cases, the Gestalt achieves a, 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 um, a reading which has more uh, complex space in it and more movements in it than a simple percept would have. That is the Gestalt. So the Gestalt expands the possibilities of what you're seeing. Um, Gestalt experiments were scientific studies of how we perceive, process, and engage sensory phenomena. Unfortunately, the immense legacy of ornament, which really was all about that, um, was being widely condemned by Euro-modernist design theorists who, after World War II, influenced the removal of its study from the curriculums of art and architecture schools. So in, in, in my early lifetime, I experienced in the Northeast, the conflation of those two projects. One was the tremendous teaching that was going on about the Gestalt phenomenology and the elimination of ornament from the curriculums. That was crazy in retrospect. A, val a valuable body of knowledge was thus blindsided. So in 1975, I founded a course entitled The Theory and Design of Ornament for Yale College. Besides reviewing the 20th century ornament of Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright, the course readings included Owen Jones' 1856 Grammar of Ornament, Racinet's Polychrome Ornament, Dolmetsch's Treasury of Ornament, and Hamlin's actually quite sophisticated 1916 history of ornament and of course we read Ruskin and uh, but it was mainly the encyclopedias uh, that visually provide us, pr pr provided us with, an, with a or the class with a survey of great ornament and at the same time I enlarged the, bl the Bloomer studio where I had made sculpture uh, which designed and fabricated ornament and architecture. It's still going. Actual practice requires designing, conceiving, negotiating, and building, and hearing the public reaction firsthand. So er, er, early on, I try to up the ante of the importance of public re, reaction and point out the absence of uh, academic uh, introduction. <clears throat> Uh, I began the course with one precise axiom 
by saying that ornament is a system of figuration, which must, must, absolutely must connect to and become embodied with the thing being ornamented. Achieving that union is an absolute property. That was the only hard axiom I put in there. You can't have an autonomous or you figure of ornament and call it ornament. It has to be united with the thing being ornamented. And it's that interaction, that closure that makes what it's trying to do actually happen. Um, uh, it cannot be autonomous. In retrospect, the biggest problem, however, in, in the early years of instructing the course remained an absence of a rigorous definition of ornament capable of distinguishing its identity from those of decoration, symbolism, signage, or works of applied art. That absence made it nearly impossible to rigorously criticize the students' designs, especially in schools of architecture. Because any student could bring in one of these alternate things that were thought to be ornament, decoration. Ornament can be an element of decoration, but it is not fundamentally decoration. It's something that you put inside of a system of decoration. Symbolism, the anthropologists love symbolism. The, the, it, it, if, if you're talking about ornament with them, they will come up with a, with, with a question about what does it symbolize? And, and if I show any doubt, they, they, they point out, well, we can provide that for you if you'd like. And, but, but please realize that that's esoteric knowledge. You know, you really have to know what you're doing to know what the symbol is, which again, put a kind of a blockade in front of ornament, that you had to have this specialized knowledge to experience ornament, which is not the case. Um, the uh, uh, signage, you know, after Venturi's book, there, there's an association between ornament and signage. It's not a sign. Um, and so on. So how do we find out what it is? In, 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 there are plenty of hints of ornament's un unique identity in Owen Jones' 1856 grammar of ornament and in Henri Fossillon's The Life Forms in Art, published in 1934. Fortunately, we have both of these books in the early part of the course. Fossillon wrote, quote, Ornament was perhaps the first alphabet of human thought to come into close contact with space. Note the term alphabet, which suggests that ornament is constituted by a finite or limited index of figures. The existence of an alphabet also allows ornament, like our phonetic alphabet, um, as being something that has developed over thousands of years. It's not a product of innovation. So, you know, uh, I say, well, if ornament, let's let's come up with a new with a new ornament. Um, let's um, let's come up with some innovation on ornament if people don't understand it. That that can't work either. Um, I, uh, uh, Kristen uh, Jesperson, who was William Geordie's student wrote the first dissertation on the grammar of ornament. Um, and he did something that, that I did and Cassandra actually did because I asked her to do it and we worked together on it. We went through all the encyclopedias to see uh, uh, if in fact there was a limited set of alphabetic things in it. And we found, yes, absolutely there was. Uh, Jordy, Jesperson, myself, and what Cass, Cassandra picked up over a long thousand of, of, of reviewing thousands and thousands of recorded ornaments, that there is a very limited number of them and that certain ornaments prevail enormously over others, such as ones which appear to have foliage, like a leaf. Uh, or, which, of course, I believe is why the acanthus and its fractal makeup uh, was so powerful in, in classical architecture. Um, 
So I found that, um, and, and, and Fass is here, and she has offered uh, to spend time with anybody who would like to uh, going over those statistics. I think they're very valuable to run over uh, examples of ornaments that have existed basically for thousands of years, file them, uh, do, a, do a figural analysis of them, and you'll see the consistency of certain of them over others. And that consistency it becomes an index of determining what is ornament um, in, for me, for sure, and evidently for quite a few others that, that actually had, had to make ornament. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll make a, a generality, which is there's probably no such thing as new ornament. That's probably a non, there's probably no such thing. That, that's that's a, a false conjecture. Um, there are new ways of fabricating it, and there are new types of things that are being ornamented. And those give you a different way of experiencing these basic figures. But that's not because ornament is new. That's because ornament has been brought in to the way we do things nowadays, which is different from its linguistic essence. Um, so uh, uh, as, as that became apparent, it sort of aligned with Fosselone's notion that it was the first, alf that that ornament provided the first alphabet to come into contact with space. Um, I found myself considering ornament as being more language-like than art-like. Art has the sense of autonomy and innovation that ornament doesn't have. Ornament has something else, which I think is extremely competitive with those two, which is it has a timelessness. It, it, it has well-seasoned tropes. It goes back to the, um, you know, Stone Age, when uh, with whatever tools they had, they would smash little marks into a spear. And as soon as they improved those, that ability to do those marks, they, they could turn those little spears into uh, more complex, but fundamentally geometric shapes. Um, and those go back thousands of years. The, the encyclopedias take us back to recorded ornament that, is, that, that we can see right now and see how it was done. It goes back about for, for, for several thousand years. Um, <clears throat> in uh, the 1969 book, Visual Thinking, by Rudolf Arnheim, who studied with Wertheimer. Wertheimer eventually came to New York and taught at the New School, um, declared that visual perception is visual thinking. A visual percept can be a malleable thought among many. So these figures of ornament are, in a sense, let's call them linguistic elements, which put together into a field of interactions does in fact narrate something, something quite clear. Um, that led me to a, um, a, a stronger urgency that the original content became a necessity. Given the magnitude of the, of the distraction and confusion that has crippled our profound understanding of ornament, although I listened to Nikos, who has very interesting ideas about it, that uh, I, I thank you for being here. He, he has explained it from an entirely different um, dimension than, than, than the kind of historical one I'm taking. But it's the same thing. It comes to the same conclusion, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it comes up. <laughs> it does, right. Um, the, uh, okay, so the, um, so I had to find this original definition um, for, for, you know, in, in, in light of, of, of the confusion. And I found my way back to Plato's Latin Academy. It is a Latin word, ornamentum, where the word was minted into Western thought. 
That was in the etymology of Isidore of Seville, which is uh, 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 an etymology in Plato's academy was sort of a mixture of, of a dictionary and an encyclopedia. And uh, Is Isidore's etymology was written in the seventh century AD. So listen carefully to Isidore's words that I'll just read them and make a declaration about what I believe he said. In the title of book 13 is The Cosmos and Its Parts. Paragraph one is titled The World de Mundo, M-U-N-D-O, and states, and now I am quoting him, quote, the world consists of the sky and the land, the sea and the creations within them. World Mundus, U.S., is named thus in Latin by the philosophers because it is in eternal motion, motus, as are the sky, the sun, the moon, the air, and the seas. Thus, no rest is allowed to its elements. On this account, it is always in motion, unquote. Part two in the same paragraph continues, and again I am quoting, quote, Whence to Varro, who in the first century before Christ was the major sort of um, etymologist in Plato's Academy. Uh, and his book on this was lost, unfortunately, it doesn't exist. Um, but he's quoting Varro. The elements seem to be animate because, he said, they move of their own accord. But the Greeks adopted a term for world, mundus, also meaning cosmetics, derived from ornament on account of the diversity of elements and beauty of the heavenly bodies. They call it cosmos, which means ornament, for which, for with our bodily eyes, we see nothing more beautiful than the world, end of quote. In ancient Greek, cosmetikos simply means cosmos made visible or audible and sensually harmonic. For Isidore, it would require making the motions within cosmos visible, harmonic, and therefore beautiful. So there it was in, on, on one page in, 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 in Isidore, a definition. It was the only definition that made complete sense to me in the light of all I have ever perceived, visually or verbally, ray ornament. The term cosmos was itself was most likely coined by the pre-Socratic philosopher Pythagoras and his colleagues. Pythagoras also formulated, by the way, the four basic forms of geometry, point, line, plane, and solid, and the four numerical ratios governing the harmony in musical chords. So the the idea of cosmos and ornament surfaced with music and or, I, I, I'll just say music and architecture and all the things that we treat as architecture uh, served um, sur surfaced in Pythagoras's research that led to the, the term cosmos. Um, so now what that leaves is, 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 is how does cosmos become a singular idea? which is visually shaped and perceived. So if we know it's cosmos and if, and, and if we accept that, if we grant that and that the, and the, and the, and the cosmos is making visible uh, the motions of things around us, the stars, er, everything as it were, um, how do we shape that? Um, music theory actually, and I, I I had come to understanding this quite a, quite a while back, but not with the clarity that has um, surfaced in, in music theory on ornament. Um, it, it helps answer that question. Basically, allow that figures of ornament are not connected to bodies of music and architecture in whole cloth. Instead, they connect directly to pure but subordinate substructures of music and architecture, which are the essential parts, the sine qua non, non of a work of architecture or a piece of music. 
I could be more precise about that. In music theory, there are three substructures that constitutes the essence, the, the essential structures of music, without which the concept of music collapses. Um, they are rhythm, melody, and harmony. So uh, what is being considered here is that ornament does not ornament music. It ornaments, for example, rhythm, or it ornaments melody, or it ornaments harmony. Some research I've done on this indicates that in the largest percentage, it, um, uh, it uh, ornaments melody. If you move over into architecture, we can go back to um, Vincent Scully, <laughs> whose sons and daughters were here. I saw you. Um, Vincent Scully was the great historian at Yale. Um, and and uh, when, when I was a student there, and he, um, he said that ornament, ornamented construction that's the way he put it. Or you could say that ornament, ornament is an element of construction. So he was doing it correctly in the sense that he wasn't saying that ornament made a big leap and was ornamenting architecture. It was ornamenting construction. Now, I've worked on that idea a little bit, and I realize that today, the way architects think and work and the way we, we all do our, you know, our designing we also think of space and it would be impossible and it, it works perfectly well to say yes one of the structures one of the essential of structures of architecture is construction but another one is spatial formation because the the architect makes coherent spaces and it's those coherent spaces that are ornamented and i've uh, had long talks with Turner Brooks about this one. And uh, I, I, um, I might have sounded at one time that I wasn't paying enough attention to space, but I have to totally grant that space is one of the um, structures that receives ornament. <laughs> there we go. So um, um, those, that's what you warn about. Uh, to do this in architecture, a figure of ornament must visually adopt properties of construction's work, but it must do so without simultaneously discarding its own particular identity. Ornament is a combinational system. It is a gestalt. That is absolutely essential to ornament. It, it's, it, it happens as an interaction between its own alphabet and a coherent event in the structure that it's ornamenting. It's a closure, it's a gestalt. Um, Jameson, the, the philosopher Jameson called ornament a para-ergon. Um, a para-ergon is an auxiliary to work. And it was one of the more interesting philosophical descriptions of ornament in, in, in recent years, in, in the recent decades, I should say. Paragon is difficult, but it, it's not incorrect. It is an auxiliary to work. <clears throat> to do this, oh wait, have I forgot to put my pictures on? Yes, I'm waiting for you to tell me when you want to see. Let's go show. back and I'm going to put some illustrations on. I was talking too much. Okay, let's put the first one on. Okay. One of the first things you find in the investigation of all the figures that are in Owen Jones and in ornament and in encyclopedias are, are the keys of ornament, like the Greek key on the upper left. Um, it then becomes apparent uh, next 
Oh wait, the the Greek key uh, uh, is uh, really a combination of a spiral, but it sometimes moves itself into a rotating uh, figure like a swastika before it can repeat. When you look at the repeats of the Greek key and soften it, it moves into a squishy Greek, a sequence of squishy uh, Greek keys, but then it moves into a wave action. So in the West, a fundamental uh, al uh, alphabetic element is the Greek key next. Can we go to the next one? I can't, I don't know why. Can we try turning that down? down? You got it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. There, there it is. Okay. So the next. Wait a second. Uh, okay, how do I make it here? The next Greek, the, so we, I went over to the Chinese side of the, of, of the discussion and found that their key was basically the one on the upper left, which is a spiral that turns back on itself. It would be as though the one on the right and the left were forming a rotation like this. When the Chinese tried to repeat their key, they built things like the repeaters down below and eventually they were able to um, figure out ways of repeating them in the last two that didn't involve the separation between two at a time. If you look down at the lower right of this, of this key diagram, you see the Chinese key of the yin yang on the left, you see it simplifying, you see it become squishy, then you see it become more rounded, it falls right into a, a yin yang circle. So this rotating equivalence is, is, is a uh, morphological attribute of the Chinese key next. Mm -hmm. Can't you do it over it? here? No. The next key of interest is the Mayan key, which is the American one, American hemispheric one, which you find in, in the Mayan Peninsula in the governor's palace. It's basically a step and a Greek key and a step and a Greek key. The, the Mayan culture was cut short, so they tended to um, use it. It became called the step and the hook. They tend to make, they tended in much of their architecture to make a, continue, a, a, a continuation of steps and a, uh, of cooks, I'm sorry, and a continuation of steps. Um, you find this in Native American ornament, this, this key that came from the Mayan Peninsula shows up in most of Native American, North American ornament. Next. <clears throat> so we indeed have these basic, basic tropes in ornament. You'll see their presence in all great ornaments. So going back to Owen Jones, who points this out very shortly in the beginning of his grammar, he then shows us the extent to which the leaf became the predominant trope in ornament, a predominant trope in ornament. In the upper left one, you have the, uh, uh, the, the sort of um, leaf and the blossom, uh, the lotus and the enthemium. And this shows up continuously as a repeat system in ornament and forms a figural, an animistic trope. Next. This also shows up in Islamic ornament. This is from Rasne, where the arabesque in the middle, uh, where they're not allowed or where they're not supposed to quote nature, still is quoted in the figure called the arabesque, which then finds its way throughout most of Moorish ornament. Next. Then there's this, going back to the Chinese, there were these wonderful examples of the entanglement of the, of the animistic trope, which is the leaf with the geometric trope of the ornament you see on the upper left. So this incredible 
composition on the right uh, is a is 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 a done in, in in the Ming Dynasty shows a conflation of those two tropes in Chinese architecture. Next, and I'd like to show you this this picture. This picture is. Um, Let me let me check my own notes uh, to make sure that I'm not conflating two utterly fascinating examples of the uh, yeah no. of ornament. Over a vast amount of time, this is a a piece of pottery made by the Cucitini Cucitini culture in northern um, Romania of the Danube Valley. Uh, that was one of the first Neolithic countries that started making ornament as we know it today and putting them on sort of man-made objects. Notice that this is a spiral in the middle that's in its in a primitive way generating six spirals around the perimeter. Now this one in around 4500 BC. Turn to the next one. This is an ornament by Lewis Sullivan in the early part of the 20th century from the Carson Perry Scott building. Notice the spiral in the center propagating the small spirals that surround it. The only thing that's really changed from a morphological standpoint here is that Sullivan is now using foliation, whereas the Cucciteni culture did not. But we have seen the survival of this trope for nearly 5,000 years, five, five, 6,000 years, um, which, is a, a very good capsule history of how ornaments alphabet develops and, and, and becomes firm. Next. So um, I'm going to hold that here. Um, <clears throat> I've talked about um, The definition of ornament as being cosmos, and I'm leading to the question, how is cosmos shaped and per perceived? The singular idea of cosmos shaped and perceived. At that point, I went to music ornament um, and, 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 and music theory. Uh, now the question I'm asking is, um, Uh, how do we put ornament into the substructure of construction's work? And in that respect, I have this picture of the um, of, of the clear story of Amiens Cathedral, which I visited shortly after World War II when it when its stained glass had been blown out and and had this elevation embedded in my brain. Um, eventually, it was determined that the ribs on Gothic cathedrals are, are doing virtually nothing to support the structure. They are not actual structure. They are ideas about structure. What's holding this building up are the buttresses. And what's holding this wall up are the core of this row of columns. The ornament would be the foils, the octafoil the quatrefoil and the trifoils um, and on, on the capitals. If you do a diagram of construction and the ornament, you'll see how they're woven together at Amiens. The ornaments are linked. The, the formation and distribution of ornament is linked with the formation and dis distribution of construction. There's where ornament comes on board and becomes a part of the architecture. Next. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, it's not working. How about clicking it? There. Oh, okay. good idea. So how did Lewis Sullivan do that? We'll jump from Lewis Armstrong to Lewis Sullivan. Lewis Sullivan, as you know, spent a couple of um, years in, 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 in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and became thoroughly versed in, in classical language. But look at what he did in the Midwest. Um, and these buildings are all, they're around 1913, 14, 15. Um, if you look at the bottom one, let's start with the bottom one. He knew that ornament had to convene with construction, but he was also building boxes. So what he did was he got to his window and he used the, he used the mullions of his window as his paradigm of construction. And he made them larger than life and he made the window mullions break loose and capture the box. Once he had done that, he ornamented the window mullions. The other thing he did was, was when he got on top of the building, he knew that ornament had to exist at the edge of a element of construction. So he puts it along at the edge of the box. So this is perfect ornament um, literacy. If you go up and look at this uh, Van Allen building that was built around 1916, um, he did the same thing. And when I first saw this, this, this building, I didn't like it, I thought it was weird. I thought, why is he taking these um, sticks, putting them on the side of the building and putting the ornament on top of them until it became perfectly obvious to me that he was doing what he was doing in his brilliance was he was addressing people in their cars who were driving by the building. This is something I've had to encounter in my own struggle with designing ornament. By getting, in a sense, a false, you know, a, a contrived element of construction, which are these vertical things and ornamenting either side of them, making them giant, he could project the ornament all the way to a moving car. Um, otherwise, if you were up against the building, you can see it along the bottom of the box. You can see miniature and beautiful ornament along the bottom ledges of the windows and along the cornice. Next. Let me see if this works. A masterpiece of, of Sullivan was to say, when, when he just designed the Grinnell Bank, was to say, well, I'm going to design a box. It's a box. This was a low budget job. So what, did, well, what, what does he do? He builds an entrance where he can visibly expose a structural system. He exposed that structural system so he could distribute his ornament into it because ornament ornaments the substructure of construction. Then he repeats the other idea at the perimeter on the top. Next. I'm going to show you my own work um, and then I can finish um, my part of it and open this up. Um, so ornament gets into the body of the building by visually adopting or creating properties of the construction's work. But it must do so without discarding its own particular identity and function. Ornament is a combinational system. It is a gestalt itself. Um, the figural uh, percepts of motion, such as the liveliness of foliage and wings, must be added to the bedrock of construction which Sullivan does eloquently. Those thoughts are visually absent. This is, this is what you have to realize. Those thoughts, those livelinesses are visually absent in the purity of construction being ornamented, while it is prevalent in the motions of the world at large. That's what uh, Is Isidore talked about 
the, his cosmos was about the motions in the world at large. So the world at large is then the motions um, embedded through ornament into the elements of construction. I tried to do this at um, the Reagan Airport by quoting the way the building was actually built. These things along the bottom show up here and then repeat in, ten, in two dimensions, something that Caesar Pelli did in three dimensions, and then those transform into elements, to active elements of ornament. Next. I did this also on a recent project in um, Norfolk, Virginia, where Herbert Newman designed, th th this building was the old, um, uh, uh, sort right. of, um, what was it called again? It, it was, it was, yeah. it was not a bank. It became a bank. It goes back to the 19th century. That was eventually um, purchased and made into the public hall library of Norfolk. Um, there's a competition to do this, to expand this. And um, the, the Newman office built this minimalist tower that expressed, Herbert loves to express construction that expressed construction. Leaving this space in the middle, which is a spatial formation, which connects those two. Mm -hmm. So we located our ornament, we ornamented space. Mm -hmm. Next. And this is an example of the old building, the new building, and a method of ornamenting the void of space. Um, so, um, what I'm going to say here about ornament, up to now I've been talking about how ornament gets into the body of music and the body of the building. And it can be done at any number or shapes of budgets. Um, the, uh, uh, the thoughts that are visually absent in the purity of construction are prevalent in the motions of the world and the environment in which the work of ornament is situated. You add to those motions or you introduce those motions through a process of additivity. The phenomenon of ornament being added is a virtue. Additivity imports diversity, expansive forces, and motions of cosmos, cosmos into our perception of the pure and simple object being ornamented. To belong to a work of architecture or a chair or a rug, the animated figures of ornament must present a kinship, a likeness, or a self-similarity with the selected moments of construction or the selected moments of spatial formation, which are essential to the work of architecture, or with those selected moments of rhythm, melody, and harmony to a piece of music. Ornament must connect the body of the objects via the structures being ornamented while simultaneously appearing to be elsewhere. So ornament has to be in motion and elsewhere while appearing to have a likeness with the thing it's ornamenting. Uh, two more pictures and I'm finished. This is how the Chinese did it in the Ming Dynasty where they put their key into the construction of a chair. This is a very beautiful chair, next. And this is how the Persians did it with their rugs. This, this is a Persian rug that I grew up with and I still have. I took a picture of it for this lecture. It's small. It's about three by five and a half feet. Um, and what fascinated me, because I, I used to look at this as a child, was compared to other ornaments, how many different kinds of leaves they have. Why do they have so many different kinds of leaves? Because what, what ornament does is it usually um, 
conventionalizes a leaf like the lotus or the, and then transforms it into the fractal of the acanthus but this is this is a lot of different conventionalizations or distillations of the idea of a leaf it, it became apparent to me that th that this particular rug which was made in, uh, in, in, in in a desert town in Iran was made basically in a uh, uh, what are they called those gnomes. Gnomes, uh, a, um, <laughs> I keep forgetting names of, of type different kinds of things but it, in in the desert they tap water and they build gardens that simulate nature and then the rug comes along and it simulates the garden that simulates nature and then it's located in a drug in a rug that becomes a principal element in an architecture or a lobby so i see this as on the one hand having um the sense of a garden or the cosmicity of a garden, but also belonging to an element of space. That's it. Um, I, I don't know whether I've overused it's my exactly time. It's exactly 7.30. It's exactly 7.30. Yeah, okay. that was great, Kent. I said I would take 25 minutes and I took 55. Should we stop? Or speech? I took 50, 48. <laughs> or, but I would love <laughs> questions <tomorrow laughs> or <laughs> disputes. Yeah. Should with we, anybody yes should we stop the chair share yeah go ahead and do that stop um, the share yeah. yeah yeah that sounds good so uh, at this point you know as ken mentioned it would be great to to have your thoughts and discussion um they said to to sort of keep it organized we invite you to um write at least a preview of what you want to ask in the chat and cass and i will will call on you call and on you. at that point yeah. feel free to uh, unmute yourself, put yourself on camera if you so wish, and uh, uh, speak to Kent directly. We've um, lost all our images. Oh, that's okay. We but can we see you. That's the important thing. We see nothing. You don't see anything. Nothing. It's uh -oh. all black. It's all black. Uh, yeah. Are you hitting escape? We hit escape. No, we're okay. We're all. We're on. Great. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, <laughs> So while um, our participants are thinking of, of some things they might want to ask Kent, um, Cass and I have some thoughts about what Kent just presented that we wanted to, to maybe start off the discussion with. Um, but as we're doing that, please, again, feel free to start typing um, into the chat any, any things you want to uh, share with Kent in the group. Um, so one question I had for you, Kent, um, was I thought it was really interesting in the beginning of your talk how you spoke about symbolism as a blockade to ornament. Um, and I find that very fascinating because, of course, ornament is culturally specific often um, in, in its manifestation. And we have symbols that mean very particular things to a certain culture that might mean a totally different thing across the world. Um, so how do you sort of reconcile um, universal expression of ornament? You know, obviously there are certain tactical elements, certain geometries, certain kinds of repetition that, that seem to communicate similar things across the world. But then... How do you reconcile that with something very specific um, that might mean, you know, I, I'm thinking, that's, for example, of a... Uh, that's a fairly simple. I mean, um, obviously, uh, ornament can do both, right? But what you hear from, from some people is saying, well, we don't need ornament because you have to understand the culture. You can't use a classical building as a different culture. You cannot use an, a, a Persian system because that's a different culture. So specific cultures are used as an excuse not to use the ornament in the present climate of academe. They're used in the in the in architecture studios. We don't have we don't know we know exactly what our you then forget the culture and use what is perhaps more important about ornament, which is it is timeless and that it transcends specific cultures. That's the only answer I could give to that. Ornament has its own um, identity and behavior. 
And what became apparent, and this is why it was important to review the encyclopedias, and Cass could talk to you about that. She could seat you with these great encyclopedias that were fashioned in the 19th century and point out the, uh, the unbelievable similarity between ornaments cross-culturally. That ornament has its own morphology independent of culture. And it's that morphology. And again, it's something that Nikos talks about because he can talk about ornament without cultural specificity, which I love. And you've always been done that. Uh, and uh, it works. He, he can say, okay, if this is what you're looking, this is what, how we can get that into your urban place. Um, and he's not starting it by saying where that urban place is and who lives in it. Hey, Ken, I, I'd love to add a little something and you can add to what I'm about to say. Um, but just in terms of uh, in terms of the research that we did, I think it's a really it kind of helps answer Misha's question. Um, we were looking at uh, I don't know between uh, across all the encyclopedias that we looked, probably about twenty different cultures at least. Um, and the magic of it was that we were able to distill um, universal elements. A lot of it had to do with geometry um, and or just you know more broadly, does this ornament have uh, nature? Does this ornament have leaves? Does it have animals? Um, and, and in terms of geometry, we're looking at axes, we're looking at what kind of repetition, what kind of symmetry. And all of these things, none of these are cultural elements. These are uh, universal because they're based on, on geometry, they're based, based on mathematics. Um, and when we're, we're talking about Things as like, like leaves, as you're saying, you've got conventionalizations, which then can can be specific to cultures, um, like the lotus leaf or um, the acanthus. Uh, but you can do the same for today. You can you can you can decide. And I, I think the the Oxford Museum um, is a really great example. Where you see these beautiful col uh, capitals that take uh, flora and fauna. That they, they want to to share and none of it is necessarily going back to uh culturally specific flora and fauna from you know the greeks or or chinese or you know it's it's more about local flora and fauna and they're taking it and conventionalizing it and it's, so it's a new sort of a new image of nature but it is still using ornaments more universal structure, geometrically speaking. So I, I think- well, you know, uh, Kaz, one way of, <clears throat> I, uh, most ornament connects its animistic figures with geometry. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I've never seen a great work of ornament that does not do that. Yeah. Even if it has to create the geometry that it connects to and then connect that connection to the actual construction or, or melody or, or whichever. Um, I've, uh, I've often wondered why it was necessary to put plants and to put wings in ornament. The ancient Chinese put serpents in them to make them be serpentine. And it was perfectly obvious by just focusing on that, that the reason why the leaves and the serpentine figures are put into ornament was to add dimensions to it. Most of the pure elements are very um, starved dimensionally. If you add the uh, animistic tropes, you increase the number of dimensions, the number of spaces. You also do that with repeating, which is a time effort. So what ornament does is, that's why I stressed additivity. So if you're looking at ornament from the standpoint of additivity, you can dismiss the anthropologist fairly quickly who says that you don't sufficiently deal with a specific culture. 
Because well, no, I know we're that, dealing with the cosmos. Because I know you wanted to say something in response to, to Kent earlier. Uh, feel free to. No. Thank you so easy. Oh, you muted. OK, uh, OK. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Kent uh, called me out, so I would like to detect the opportunity to fight back. Uh, uh, Kent took two of my conclusions from my talk, which is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> which is wonderful, because uh, we, come at, uh, we come to this topic from a totally different perspective. So the first conclusion that Kent made at the beginning, he said that ornament is not added on. Ornament is an integral whole part of the entire structure. Ornament is, uh, has to be one and um, coherent with the entire structure. It is not added on. It is a part of the entire structure. So there is, there is a union between the large scales and the small scales. Yeah. So when we, that's, that's, that's my conclusion too, so great. So, but that has a further conclusion that can't, uh, said that if you um, if you make that coherence, then where the the, the etymology or the the uh, anthropology of the ornament is not relevant really, We're because sure. you want to make it you want to make it coherent, and the coherence comes from geometrical mathematical rules. So the the uh, the anthropologists okay that that becomes of secondary importance. It is. Yeah, and uh, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's, it's very interesting what the anthropologists are doing, as long as they don't say that that's the thing that you should only be doing. I mean, they bring something to the table, but they don't bring the essence of ornaments to the table. No, and, and they're not commissioned to create ornaments for buildings like you are. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, and the second, the second uh, uh, conclusion from my talk, which anticipated by Kent, is that there is no such thing as modern ornament. Ornament is ornament, and it has to be uh, appropriate to whatever you're ornamenting and you do your best job. Uh, you can have uh, contemporary expressions of ornament by using manufacturing techniques and materials. But there's no such thing as new ornament, right? Yeah, right. The, the ornament is ornament because it is uh, a, a, an expression of small scale with all these the intricacy of the of the of the scales that somehow ties the space together. Yep. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Kent, for your talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Much. Thank you. I've always thanked you. I mean, I always talk about this. Well, so, look, uh, forward, uh, to, to, uh, look forward to the continuation next week when Nikos gets to expand on that. Okay. Um, uh, ben, I know you have a, a question that you've had up for a while. Uh, if you want to ask Kent. Hi. Uh, hi, Kent. Uh, wonderful talk. Enjoyed it. And I'm sorry I missed the beginning. Where, uh, where were we? Ben Nortra. Oh, Ben. Hi. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> hey, um, do you, uh, I, I, I don't know if you mentioned this at the beginning of your talk, um, but did you, do you still subscribe to the distinction between the added and the super added, the added being the expression of construction and the super added being the ornament? And I'm wondering if perhaps you don't based on your what, what, what the conversation you just had with uh, Nicholas? Is that to me or, or to Nicholas? It's to, it's to you. It's me. I, I, uh, I'm comfortable with that concept. I don't use it as much as I used to, but um, I think what it's saying is that, um, well, let's talk about Sullivan. Sullivan adds construction by exploding his mullions, doesn't he? And then you add the ornament to the exploded mullion. So that would come off as super added. It fits that sequence. Yeah. Um, it's, um, and in fact, I think the first time I, oh, that, that term is quoted in, um, yeah, uh, James Summerson, I, be, I believe, made made that statement, yeah. and what he what he was talking about was suppose you take a, a column, which is a pipe column, and then you fatten it up so that it it has intastis and it becomes sensual. Yes, and then you put the capital on it. Yeah. That that's a three-step action. That was his way of doing it, and I think that's true. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I was shifting a little bit more towards, uh, I think I was, I, I think what Summerson didn't do in that, I think very nice uh, paragraph that he wrote was, um, was talk enough about the the content of ornament, which is why I had to go to the to Plato's Academy, because that's where they seem to pin it down. Um, and and by the way, um, I didn't have time to talk about it very much, but when uh, I'll be quick so we can get another question. But when I was first teaching ornament to CL college students, you know, they're smart ass characters. They, they always say, now what the hell is this thing? You know, they, they, um, they want content. They're not gonna let anything go by you. And um, the, that was a hard question to answer. What is, does content, does ornament have a content of its own? that it was born with and brings with it. And that's why the journey to cosmos was helpful. But you have to understand what cosmos meant or means, which was the making visible the harmonic uh, motions. And I think that works. Was it, does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that, uh, that, that, that analysis of added and super added has just really yeah. kind of stuck uh, with me. Uh, I, I would put those two next to each other and do it yes. both ways. But I, I remember when I did that, I, I, I didn't um, satisfy certain content seekers. Yeah, okay. And I think the content, content seekers are, are, are on our side if you're an ornamental. And you shouldn't let them down uh, because um, many of the antagonists against ornament say it doesn't have any content. It's, it's, it's wishy-washy. It's, it's artistic, you know, flim-flam. Yes. But it isn't. Not good ornament. So you have to dismantle or deconstruct those negative critiques. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have another question from Jeremy. His question is, Ge geometry and mathematics are universal, but don't the Chinese and Greek key examples suggest that different cultures make different geometric choices? So if you could expand upon that. Say that again, Cass, a little louder. Right. Okay, sure. All right, so ge geometry and mathematics are universal, but don't the Chinese and Greek key examples suggest that different cultures make different geometric choices? If you could expand on that. Yes, I can. Um, it's, it's a little bit about, uh, well, let's, let's, let me put it this way. As a mathematician yourself, and most of us are, we wouldn't be talking about this, that we do math, we do geometry. Uh, I see a great similarity between the Chinese key and, and the Mayan and the Greek key. I see more similarity than dissimilarity. They both use the spiral. They both explore repetition. They're both very tightly packaged geometric constructs. Um, and yes, they're different, but I think their difference pales compared to their similarities. I think I would answer it that way. Um, I, I mean, China is kind of interesting. You, I go to China now and and you can see the strange ways that their basic key still appears all over the place. It appeared at the Olympics, but you can see it appearing in um, stores and in a variety of curious places. It it's usually gets mixed up with the Greek key or some other like shape, but it 
it shows that yeah yeah we Chinese sort of know that's our that's the one we really did a lot with but they don't end up even Chinese students don't end up claiming it saying this is ours and nobody else's I mean and as soon as it goes into our culture we 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 use it we use it all the time so it just happened to be if you go back to shang bronzes uh in the third century bc in china which was quite a bit later than the cucciatini in the danube valley you'll see that it's full of chinese keys they 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 use chinese keys as sort of a pattern in their excavated um, decoration of the bronzes. So it's very, it's very much a, 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 a habitual trope in China. Um, I mean, it's really making me think about this idea of ornament as language that um, you know, we titled this this talk language of ornament, and it's interesting to think. You know, we we all share kind of the same limited set of phonemes that the human palate can produce, and then we have languages that select from those phonemes um, and and create systems of expression. But a lot of the underlying structure is similar, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's an appropriate analogy or not, because I feel like what you're saying is the keys are actually probably even closer than than languages um, across sort of the the human world are but I wonder if it's a productive one to think about. Well, I, I, that, a good thought. I, I struggled with that um, because we decided to use the concept of language, which I've been struggling with because a lot of writers about ornament, including Fosselone and, and, and others, use the language uh, term. Um, it's... it's um, It's a visual language. It's not a verbal language. That's where the, where the Gestalt psychology comes in. And where Arnheim comes in that says, a perception is, is th perceiving is thinking. So, so when you see a, a particular key in the Shang dynasty, you know that they were thinking. You, you know what they were thinking about. That's one way of, um, your question had to do with whether one can stay with, with, with the concept of language, correct? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting given what you said, like imagine you found a scroll from that period and you tried to decipher it using ancient Chinese and your knowledge of Chinese that's very imperfect, you know, and, and built over centuries by scholars trying to understand what it means. Your understanding of that and your emotional connection to the author, I think, is far um, inferior to your emotional connection to the author of Ornament from a few thousand years ago. So I think maybe that kind of that's what you're implying here is that it's a language that doesn't require us to learn the ancient language right. to understand it. We don't have to know ancient Greek or ancient Chinese uh, oh, no. to, to, to understand at least on some level their ornament. The inventor of the word cosmos was Pythagoras and he was a geometer. He was not an anthropologist. He uh, he invented the geometry that we know: point, line, surface, solid. And he also had a monochord, and he was subdividing the frequencies. He had a a he was able to in 500 BC um, um, uh, calculate the frequency of of, of a string on a monochord. So what he was doing was um, looking at ratios between things to come up with his number four in both systems. So that, that actually, the, why am I saying that? That, that the, the word cosmos is really talking about ratios. It's not talking about human behavior. It's talking about natural ratios in the universe that we experience. 
We have two really great questions here, um, and I want to let uh, Nicholas and Trevor both ask them. Uh, Nicholas, do you want to um, unmute and ask, or do you rest read it? What did you say? I'm not asking if, uh, Nicholas Rapp had a great question here, but yeah. um, I don't see him. So should we just read his question? I think we read it. Okay. Sure. Um, so his question, you, you contrasted many different terms to ornament, symbol, sign, etc. Could you talk about the ornament, uh, talk about ornament as contrasted to patterns or pattern making? Should we conflate the two terms? Um, like a pattern language per se, or should we distinguish the two? I think that pattern is is more fundamental to ornament than signage symbol or uh, I think that's what I was trying to say. I, I perhaps didn't say it well. Um, that that the use of sign symbol um, is usually used to to cloud your understanding of ornament. Uh, I think pattern does not cloud your sim your understanding of ornament. I think it's much closer to what, what ornament is about. Yeah, I, I don't know whether that's an answer to, to your question. But it could have been that when I talked about sign and symbol, I was I made it sound like they they were val valuable um, uh, ways of identifying ornament. I was actually trying to say the opposite. They, they take you away from of the most valuable understanding of ornament. Uh, and, and symbol, symbol in particular, I mean, these symbols will, um, I go to the anthropologists. I love anthropologists. They're great. They're funny. They're neat people. They do strange things. But when they when they try to sit there and say that you can't understand ornament without understanding the symbol of, of a specific culture, I'm out of the room because that's not true. Um, you can't understand ornament without going to symbolism. You can understand or you can understand ornament without going to uh, signage. However, that doesn't mean that ornament doesn't engage those two conditions. It does. It can be adopted as a symbol. It can be used as a sign, but that is not a defining feature of ornament per se. Does that answer the question? I think the last, the last part of uh, his question had to do with conflating the, the terms pattern and ornament um, and what the difference between the two is, whether one is the other. Yeah. Well, the difference between pattern and ornament is that ornament has a content, cosmos, and pattern does not. That's why I spend so much time searching Plato's Academy to find out what the content was intended to be. Once you grant that it's cosmos, it's more specific than pattern. Pattern is the generality and cosmos is the specific identifier of ornament. I guess to add to that, um, maybe you would say that part of what allows ornament to have to, to play with cosmos, cosmos is the fact that it's dealing with a holder or something that it is being applied to and working with, as opposed to a free, like an applied pattern that doesn't have anything to do with an object. Because it's, it's the, um, when the holder and the ornament are connected, you have a condition of transition right in front of your eyes. It's important that the ornament remain different from the holder in order to maintain the energy of difference, which is a, which is a property of cosmos. And that's why I, 
I focus so much on the concept of Gestalt. A Gestalt, going back to the five phenomenon or the figure ground, is a two-ness that establishes a thirdness. That's a good question. Go to the next question. Yeah, uh, Trevor, since you're here, do you want to unmute, ask your question? You know, surprisingly, this discussion about pattern kind of veered into answering my question more or less exactly. In the chat, I had asked about the symmetric and in fact modular nature of all of the visual examples in the presentation. And that makes me wonder, does pattern, does, does ornament entail symmetry? Yes. And I think, I think maybe you're answering it by appealing to, to pattern as kind of a super category of which ornament is a type. But in the realm of generic pattern, you can imagine all sorts of, uh, I'm wanting to mount a, a modernist defense to the no new ornament sort of thing. Yeah. I, I follow, but I, I, think I'm, I think I'm finally following the, the discussion, which is you can have all sorts of um, randomly generated or stochastic, all sorts of patterns, but not all patterns are going to function as ornament. Right. But symmetry, uh, Symmetry is, is very interesting. Did you, did you see how evident it was in, in the keys? And it's also evident in, in repeating in, in repeating structures, you know, things. Um, there, 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 um, there, there, there is an ornament in music called a term. Mu music has has lay, has named all its ornaments. Um, architecture has two, but it forgets what they are. You find them in strange places as being as as having a primary meaning, like a palmet has a primary meaning, which is ornament. Then it's supposed to be like a lotus leaf. That's a secondary meaning. Um, the um, uh, symmetry. Symmetry patterns or theories of symmetry are essential to understanding geometry. You would agree with that. And all of the um, um, geometry plays a very strong role in ornament. It's usually paired with, with an animistic so you get a Greek key and a leaf. That, that that shows immediately up immediately in the in, in in Owen Jones' treatment of Greek ornament, Greek Greek repeating ornament. Um, but to do the geometry side, you you have to know your symmetry. It's a very powerful um, and and limited. There there are only twenty seven symmetries in two dimensions. So it belongs to the idea of a, a finite set or an alphabet. Yeah. And uh, I think that question on asymmetries is um, definitely come by this time next week um, to the ornament neuroscience lecture because um, yeah. Richard Taylor is going to be talking about Fractal symmetry. No, no, no. Yeah, all right. Um, and I think it's very interesting actually to look at some of the fractals Richard Taylor is going to show us next week yeah. and ask which of them are ornament and which of them don't qualify as ornament. And I would say, you know, many, many of them are stochastically, you know, randomly ge generated. Uh, they don't necessarily have a legible pattern to them. They read kind of in the same way that, um, you know, branches or trees read. Um, and, and I think it's worth asking, you know, what do we lose when we try and call that ornament? I think there is something fundamental to what Kent is saying here that mm -hmm. for something to be legible to have expression beyond sort of just a, a random soothing pattern. Um, it, it does seem like um, there's that, that geometric structure there. Really but if you call, if you call a, um, a fractal or, if you say it's an ornament and don't qualify that statement, you're, you're actually doing a disservice to ornament. Yeah. What you should say is it's a figure of ornament 
that becomes a full ornament when it encounters its holder. But, uh, but, uh, but, but ornament cannot be an autonomous figure. That's a big mistake that's made in the in the academy. The uh, I, I got a phone call from an Italian architecture school a few months ago, and they wanted to zoom me in to make a critique of their ornament that they had assigned. What they had assigned, what they, what they had done was they had given their students pieces of clay and asked each one of them to make an ornament. I said, I couldn't, I couldn't join their review board because they're not doing ornament. <laughs> So, so they invited me to, to tell me what ornament was and agreed they would change their curriculum. Like <laughs> Fantastic. And, and that's why it's important to be, I think, rigorous in discussing ornament. You have to be rigorous. It's been shattered by being compared to too, too many things without giving its, its real existence. and performance on, on front and center. It has to have. That's why when I started this course to these feisty undergrads that they had to accept that ornament absolutely must be connected to something being ornamented. So they could never become autonomous. I, can't, I think it always goes back to the definition of cosmos and what it means to be cosmological. Yes. A cosmos has to do with relationships between things and you, having a standalone object or piece of art is not cosmos. It is not connected to a viewer or connected to an object um, and the way an ornament does. And that, that's what makes it so unique. Yeah. Yeah. Or ornament, one of the nice things about ornament is that it can accept a tough definition. It, it thrives under a tough definition. Uh, as far as the Italian school was concerned, I gave it a tough definition. This is axiomatic, A, B, C, D. They did another project and the ornament was actually appeared. If you go in and say, let's, let's have an open you know, let's leave this thing loose, you know. You're, you're not going to get much. You, it's no good. Um, it, uh, and that's what, Cass, that's what uh, is so important about your reviewing the grammar and Dalmich and other people and pointing out the, the, rep the majority use of tropes. Yeah. It's a, it's a real thing. Ornament is actual. We have a, a question. Sorry, VCK, for ignoring you for so long. Um, that it, um, was asked before I get to it, though, um, realizing it's 805, whoever needs to leave. Oh, uh, thanks yeah. for joining us. Um, you know, we, we can hang out here still and continue the discussion, but um, but this has been phenomenal so far it and really do you remember to join us next wednesday at the well, same join. we should leave too. yeah we should leave. i thought it was okay. 7 30. No. all right well i have i have well, one I more question think was by everybody hi yeah, we do have one more question i feel bad but we remained faithful <laughs> but bye there's sarah oh sarah hi our niece, <laughs> our niece. sarah bloomer yeah. <laughs> same family <laughs> she, she, she's one of the smartest members of the Bloomer family, so we can expect her to share. Yes. <laughs> Sarah um, Bloomer is very special. <laughs> she's with yeah. us. Yeah. Okay. No, Goodbye. Okay. Goodbye. I, I, mind if we, okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll have VCK email um, the question to you because I feel bad. Um, but please join us next Wednesday um, you, and also the 26th for the That's following lectures. Okay, turn, turn. Ooh, who was that? That was Mark, his son. Did you hear me say who was that? Yes. 
Oh. <laughs> uh, we better, that was my we cousin. Off. We better log off because I think everyone's listening to us. <laughs> I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you. I'm calling you right now. You got a shout out. That was nice. <laughs> Come on, Vicky, get off. <laughs> oh, Vicky, you're VCK. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Uh oh. Hi, guys. I'm so sorry. We, we totally uh, did not get to your question. No, I, I wrote you. It's totally fine. I'll I can talk to Kent offline. Totally fine. Or okay. next or next. It's a great question, and I encourage you to come to the lecture. On what was Vicky's question? What was it? Oh, Sarah, 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 Sarah. <laughs> I, I, I think you are going to talk about it next week. It's neurobiological. Yes, we're yes. Definitely, definitely exactly what you yeah. asked about. Yeah. Um, it's going to be very much the subject of. Um, of next week okay. to talk about how the mind creates symmetry in particular fractals. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and but thank like, you for bringing Kendall there. We'll definitely like thirty-five years ahead of fractals. Like, like we're way beyond Mendelbrot. Now we're at Candle. So, yeah. so right. So, yeah, I took Ken's class four hundred years ago because I'm Sarah's <laughs> age. But um, anyway, <laughs> you guys are great. We'll thank see you, you next so time. Much. Yeah, thanks. That was fun. See you next I'm time. Good. Try to hang up. I'm I'm gonna try. Leave. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye.